This is the fourth video supplement for CIS 251, Grand Valley State University's course on computer organization and assembly language. In this video, I'll discuss binary. In addition to the how, like how do I convert between binary and decimal, I'll spend most of this video discussing the why. Why do we use binary? Why do these conversion algorithms work? If you're interested in the how only, you can either skip ahead to the time shown below on the screen or watch the abridged version of the video. If you do skip ahead to the how parts, don't tell me. I'm kind of old-fashioned that way. The first video presented a combinatorial circuit as a blue box that can answer yes-no questions about integers, such as is x prime. This box uses a light as output, on for yes and off for no, and a series of switches to specify the integer we're asking about. The third video explained that using n switches allows us to ask the box about two to the n different integers. This also means that in order to ask about n different integers, you need to put log base 2 of n switches on the box. Remember, log is defined to be the operation that undoes an exponent. The main purpose of this video is to discuss what those n switches mean. In the first video, I mentioned that, in theory, we can assign integers to switch positions arbitrarily. Whoever designs the box gets to define what each sequence of switch positions means. For example, I could arbitrarily decide that when all three switches are off, I'm asking about the box about the number 14. Similarly, I could decide that when the first two switches are off and the third one is on, I'm asking about 33, and so on. However, such arbitrary assignments are rarely used and rarely useful. Let's think about why. Over the course of the semester, we'll be building a CPU for a general purpose computer. This CPU will be for the most part, a collection of combinatorial circuits that work together. Clearly, we don't want the circuits to be using different mappings. That would be like having a meeting where everyone was speaking a different language. It could certainly be done, but would be frustrating and a lot of extra work for everybody. Common sense suggests that all, or at least a vast majority of the circuits should use the same mapping between integers and switch positions, which would be the equivalent of having all of the circuits speak the same language. So if all the circuits are going to speak the same language, or more precisely use the same mapping, then we want to choose a mapping that works well for a wide variety of circuits. So what properties would such a good general purpose mapping have? Well first, it should scale indefinitely. That means it should be able to handle any number of switches. We don't want to pick a map that just stops working once we need more than, say, 64 or 128 switches. That also means that the map can't be arbitrary. It needs to be based on rules or a formula. If we choose an arbitrary map, then that means the map is simply a list between switch positions and integers, and the list will eventually come to an end, which is the sort of upper bound we just said we don't want. Finally, the formula needs to be reasonably simple. We, of course, don't want to spend any more time than necessary figuring out how we should be setting the switches. Now, let's think about the range of this mapping. And by that, I mean the set of integers that we can ask about. We know that n switches allow us to ask about 2 to the n different integers. But which 2 to the n integers? Well, first, I will argue that the range should include 0. If we're going to make a one-size-fits-all mapping, 0 better be part of it. And this range should be a contiguous set of values. That means there shouldn't be any holes in it. I mean, if there was a hole, where would you put it? I mean, would you really design a system that allows you to ask about a whole bunch of integers except 312? And also, at this point, we're going to focus our attention on non-negative numbers, which means positive numbers and zero. I'll talk about negative numbers in a future video. If we exclude negative numbers, but include zero, and also insist that the range be contiguous, then the range must start with zero, because there isn't anything lower than zero that we're considering right now, and then extend upward until we've used up all 2 to the n integers, which of course happens when we get to 2 to the n minus 1. The next question is, which switch positions correspond to which integers? Let's consider the specific case where we have four switches. And as we did in video one, we're going to label the switches with zero and one instead of on and off. The reason will become obvious in a minute. First, how should we encode zero? In other words, which switch positions should mean zero? 
Well, hopefully you agree that four zeros makes the most sense. That's not to say it's the only way to do it, but if you're going to design such a mapping from scratch, this seems like the most logical place to start. Okay, so now how about one? Again, I hope you'll agree that 0001 is the most obvious thing to try. Now things get more interesting. How should we encode two? 0002 doesn't work because two is not a valid switch position. The switch only has zero and one on it. Well, we've used both combinations that begin with three zeros, so we'll have to change one of those zeros to a one. And as I explained earlier, we want an easy formula to follow. We want an easy way of choosing which of these three zeros we should flip. Well, how about we continue working right to left and change the unused zero on the right, the one closest to the switch we've been working with so far. When we do that, we get 0010. Okay, so now how should we encode three? Well, let's take two and simply add one to it. Again, that's not the only way to do it, but until we encounter a problem, there's no reason to do anything other than sort of the first obvious thing that comes to mind. To encode four, we face the same problem as encoding two. All four choices using the two rightmost bits have been taken, so we continue the pattern we just discussed and we'll flip the next available bit to the left, giving us 0, 1, 0, 0. What we're really doing is writing the integers in base 2. Before explaining what base 2 is, I'll quickly review base 10, something you know very well, even if you don't know it by that name. Base 10 simply refers to the system of place value we use to write numbers the normal way. For example, when you write 4,327, you're really saying 4,000s plus 300s plus 210s plus 7. Or, in other words, 4 times 10 cubed plus 3 times 10 squared plus 2 times 10 to the first plus 7 times 10 to the zero power. The 10 in base 10 refers to the fact that each column represents a power of 10. The choice of 10 as a base is arbitrary probably a result of our having 10 fingers. The system works using any integer as a base, except 0 and 1. Representing numbers in base 2 is ideal for designing computers. First, it's based on two values, which lines up well with our switch analogy. It also provides the simple rules for setting switch positions that we talked about earlier. Let's look at some examples. Let's begin with 1101 base 2. Following the pattern of base 10, although this time right to left, we see that this means 1 times 2 to the 0 power plus 0 times 2 to the first power plus 1 times 2 squared plus 1 times 2 cubed. When we expand the powers of 2, this is the same as saying 1 times 1 plus 0 times 2 plus 1 times 4 plus 1 times 8. Add that all up and we see that 1101 base 2 is equivalent to 13 in base 10. All right, let's try it again with a slightly longer number. Again, right to left, this means 1 times 2 to the 0 power plus 1 times 2 to the first power plus 0 times 2 squared plus 0 times 2 cubed plus 1 times 2 to the fourth power. Or expand it out, 1 times 1 plus 1 times 2 plus 0 times 4 plus 0 times 8 plus 1 times 16. We add this all up and we see that this binary number is the same as 19 in base 10. Got it? Just to be sure, we're going to do this one more time very quickly. Again, right to left, 1 times 2 to the 0 plus 0 times 2 to the 1st plus 1 times 2 squared plus 1 times 2 cubed plus 0 times 2 to the 4th plus 1 times 2 to the 5th plus 1 times 2 to the 6th plus 1 times 2 to the 7th. Expand out the powers of 2 and we have 1 times 1 plus 0 times 2 plus 1 times 4 plus 1 times 8 plus 0 times 16 plus 1 times 32 plus 1 times 64 plus 1 times 128, which when added all up gives us 237 base 10. Now that you can convert a binary number to decimal, I'm going to show you how to convert decimal to binary. This is a little more difficult, but in some sense it's more important because it's how you take a number that you're thinking about and represent it in a form that the computer can use. Or, keeping with the theme of earlier videos, this is the process of figuring out how to set the switches on the blue box. I'm going to demonstrate two techniques. The first technique is how most people convert decimal to binary using pencil and paper. Let's take 27 as an example. We begin by figuring out how many digits we need. 27 is larger than 1, so we need more than one digit. It's also larger than 2, 4, 8, and 16, so we assume we need digits for these columns as well. However, it is not larger than 32, so we don't need this sixth digit. 
If we were to put a 1 here, it would give us a binary number larger than 27. Therefore, we take a step backward and consider the value for the fifth digit, the 16's place. 27 is larger than 16, so we'll make this digit a 1. Putting a 1 in the 16's place accounts for 16 of the 27 we're trying to construct. When we take 16 away from 27, we see we have 11 left to go. 11 is larger than 8, so we'll put a 1 in the 8's place, leaving us 3. 4 is larger than 3, so we'll put a 0 in the 4's place. If we were to put a 1 in the 4's place, we'd end up with a binary number larger than 27. 2 is not larger than 3, so we put a 1 in the 2's place, leaving us 1 left, which we account for by putting a 1 in the 1's place. When we subtract this 1 away, we see we've accounted for all 27. So we can now bring these coefficients together into a single binary number. If you're skeptical, pause the video for a minute to see that 11011 is in fact the binary representation of 27. Let's do it again, this time with 18. 18 is larger than 1. It's also larger than 2, 4, 8, and 16, so we're pretty sure we need these columns. But it's not larger than 32, so we'll take a step back and look at the 16's column. We put a 1 in the 16's column, take the 16 away from 18, and see that we have 2 left. 2 is less than 8, so we'll put a 0 in the 8's place. It's also less than 4, so we put a 0 in the 4's place. It's not less than 2, so we can put a 1 in the 2's place. When we subtract away 2, we see we've accounted for all 18, so we'll put a 0 in the remaining column. Again, bring the coefficients down, we get 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, which if you expanded it out and added it, you would see is the binary representation of 18. This technique for converting decimal to binary works well, especially if you're doing the conversion longhand, but it does require you to make two passes through the number. A right to left pass to figure out how many digits you need, and then a left to right pass to figure out the values of the digits themselves. I'm now going to show you a technique that requires only one right to left pass. This is the type of algorithm you would use if you were to write a program to convert decimal to binary. Let me start by pointing out some facts that the algorithm relies on. First, every even number has the form 2 times k for some integer k. For example, 26 is equal to 2 times 13, so in this case, the k would be 13. 108 is equal to 2 times 54. This 2 times k form is the definition of an even integer. Likewise, odd numbers have the form 2 times k plus 1 for some integer k. For example, 27 is 2 times 13 plus 1, and 109 is 2 times 54 plus 1. Again, this 2 times k plus 1 form is the definition of odd. Also, to multiply a base 10 number by 10, you simply add a 0. For example, 1,342 times 10 is 13,420. Now, I know you all know this and have been doing it for years, but I do want to take a minute to make sure you remember why this trick works. Let's start by writing 1342 as its base 10 expansion. Now we're going to multiply this number by 10, and to do that we'll distribute the 10 across all of the components, which gives us a, an expression like 1 times 10 times 10 cubed plus 3 times 10 times 10 squared and so on. Now multiplying all these powers of 10 by 10 simply adds 1 to all of the exponent. And at this point we can also just add a 0 to the end, which I'm going to write as 0 times 10 to the 0, since there is no 10 to the 0 term here. And what you see is nothing more than a base 10 expansion of 13,420. The same principle applies to base 2. To multiply a base 2 number by 2, you also simply add a 0. For example, 13 times 2 is 26, and when you look at their binary values, you see that the binary value for 26 is the binary value for 13, followed by a 0. And this works for the same reason it works in base 10. So if we were to take the binary expansion of 13, multiply it by 2, and distribute that 2 over all of the terms, each term then has a power of 2 multiplied by 2, which simply adds 1 to each exponent. And as before, we'll add 0 times 2 to the 0 to get a binary expansion of 26. Now let's put all of this together into an algorithm that allows us to get our binary number in a single pass. As before, we'll use 27 as our first example. Because 27 is odd, we know it's of the form k times 2 plus 1, where in this case, k is 13. We can very easily write out this expression in binary. So we can write out the binary value of 13, 
and then to multiply it by two, we simply add a zero and then add one. Conveniently enough, this addition is a very simple addition problem. The first term always ends in a zero because it's a multiple of two. The second term is always a zero or a one. It's a one in this case because 27 is odd, but if we had an even integer, it would be zero. That means that there's never a carry in the sum from the rightmost column to the next column. Or another way of looking at that is the, the digits on the left side never change. And here's how we can leverage that. Given a decimal value we want to convert to binary, we first write down a one for odd numbers or zero for even numbers. And then we simply just write down to the left of that the binary for the corresponding k. We also need a way of getting the binary value of the k, but we can just reapply this algorithm recursively. Let's see how this algorithm works from beginning to end for 27. 27 is two times 13 plus one. So we take the one and write that down as our rightmost digit. We now need to convert 13 to binary. 13 is two times six plus one, so we write the one down and we have to convert six to binary. Six is two times three plus zero because it's even, so we write down the zero and convert three to binary, which is two times one plus one, write down the one, and we're left with a final one, which we just append to the left side of the number. We're left with 11011 in binary, which is 27 in base 10. Let's see that again, but this time for 18. 18 is even, so it is two times nine plus zero. That zero becomes our rightmost digit, and we have to write nine in binary. Nine is two times four plus one. We write down the one and write four in binary, which is two times two plus zero, so we write down the zero and write two in binary, which is two times one plus zero. So we write down another zero. We're left with a final one, which we write down on the left side of the number giving us 10010 in binary, which is 18 in base 10. So there you have two possible algorithms for converting decimal numbers to binary. We covered base two and base 10 here because they're especially useful for what we wanna do. As I mentioned earlier, this place value system works with any integer as a base except zero and one. In the next video, we'll see some examples of other integers as bases. In particular, we'll take a close look at base 16, also called hexadecimal, which has a special relationship to binary that makes it especially useful in computer science. Thanks for watching.